Please welcome Please. to the stage our pastor for the last time, but our friend forever, the Reverend Dr. David McDonald. Yeah, yeah. Morning, everybody. Love you guys. Go ahead and grab a seat. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. What a journey, man. 16 years, eight months. Thanks so much. Thank you. I can't, I cannot fully express the depth of gratitude that I feel to you as my church. And um, it's amazing. It's taken me the rest of my life to continue reflecting appropriately on all that you have given to me. You've made me stronger. You've made me more intelligent. You've made me more loving and more compassionate. And um, I, 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 would not be the Christian that I am without your pastoring of me and of my family. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces out here today. Man, how do you, how do you go through uh, all this stuff without, without just seeing your friends? It um, means the world to me that my Michigan dad is uh, playing the B3 today. Uh, my, my real dad, uh, of course, passed away a couple years ago. So, Craig, thanks, thanks for being here. That, that means a lot. And um, so many friends out here. Um, brother, thank you. Thank you. I love you. I love you. It's, uh, of course, my family is, is uh, here with me today, my wife and my two kids. And uh, Kelly mentioned that my family has been deeply involved, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank them. And there was a, a season uh, early on in my tenure at Westwinds when I just, I just didn't feel like I had anything left to give. And, um, and I wanted so badly to quit. I wanted so badly to quit. And Carmel, you didn't let me. You wouldn't. You told me I was stronger. You redirected my frustration and despair toward the Lord. You required that I draw deeply on the Holy Spirit. And I am so fantastically grateful for that. You made me stronger when I had no strength left to give. And um, if you've been around here for a while, then you probably have been over to the, um, the bookstore uh, checkout. And uh, you've seen the kind of cool countertops and bookcases that are all there. And uh, my son and I built those which is really great. And uh, Jake's been involved in all kinds of ways at, at West Winds, uh, but that was the first time he had no choice. That was the first time where I, I made him. Uh, we were going to learn some tools. And, um, and if you'll forgive me, one, one small parental indulgence here. Um, uh, this is the, the Bible that I've been using since uh, COVID started. The first, the first day of shutdown, I grabbed one of these free Bibles from, uh, from the t table over here at the checkout counter. And it's been my habit for years to, to preach until a Bible like, doesn't exist anymore. You know, I use the same preaching Bible. Usually it lasts about a year, um, and then they kind of fall apart. And then I, I pray a lot about to whom I should give these Bibles. And I gave one to my friend John Mefford. I gave one to my friend Rick Wrangler, who you heard in the video. I gave one to my son several years ago, which was really uh, a precious moment for me because I'm so so proud of him. And um, I remember my dad giving me one of his Bibles. And I prayed a lot about this Bible. Anna, would you come here for a minute, please? This is my daughter, Anna, with whom I am well pleased. And I've been wanting to give this to you for a long time. Um, because I know there's a call of the Lord upon your life to heal other people and to minister to other people. And so I thought about doing this privately where you wouldn't be embarrassed, but then I thought, well, you're my daughter, so you're not going to be embarrassed. You know, it's okay. Um, but I also, I wanted to give this gift of my emotion and vulnerability to you, my church, and to model for you what it's like to bless your children. And, and sweetheart, I love you. I'm proud of you. Uh, really, I have nothing left to say. I mean, uh, it's amazing to get to the end and go, wh whatever sermons I had, you heard them, um, and probably more than, than really I had and probably more than you really wanted to hear. 
um, whatever tricks there were up my sleeve, I tricked them. Uh, I, I feel complete. I feel as though I have run the race the Lord has set before me, and I have encountered tremendous joy in the process and learned and stretched and grown. And I, uh, I thought a lot about what I might say on my last Sunday, and in particular at 11 o'clock, you know, the last, the last opportunity I have to serve you as your pastor. And I, w- I do want to say thank you um, for the way that you've been so good to us and not only been, been good to me as your pastor, but when I announced my, um, they keep calling it retirement, but I'm 44, I can't really be retired. Um, my dissolution, I don't know, my vanishing act, um, that I would be graduating is the term I prefer uh, to become a full-time missionary through the chapter house, um, which is a, a place in, in Jackson where we train creative pastors. And, um, and one of our good friends, Jamin, is here. Love you, brother. Thanks for being here, man. This is a big part of the chapter house. Um, you guys, you never, you never turned on me or on the chapter house. Uh, you never treated the chapter house like a distraction. You never treated the chapter house like a, like a mistress. You always just believed and trusted that what the Lord was doing through me um, benefited the church at large. And that's a, that's a great gift that shows that you have resident in your hearts an understanding of the grace of God's kingdom uh, poured out through us um, for everybody. So thank you for that. And I also thought I, I, I want to apologize um, and ask for your forgiveness for all the ways in which I was inadequate and I didn't, I didn't measure up. I wasn't there for you all the time. Um, and, and I want to tell you I love you. It's a great joy to be able to continue serving here um, as a drummer. And um, next week I'll play drums. You should bring earplugs. Um, but don't bother complaining because I don't have to be nice to you anymore. So <laughs> I'm just warning you in advance that that's not going to go your way. Um, but I thought, if it's my last kick at the can, I, uh, I really don't have anything new to say. But I do want to make explicit some of the things that I tried to implicitly pass on to you over the years, things that I was hoping you would pick up on. And, and so what I want to do is I want to look at three areas of research um, over the last almost two decades and summarize them for you. Um, because these are the real hallmarks of my ministry. These are my peculiar contributions to Christian theology and pastoral ministry and, and Western Christianity. And, and the first of those is, is happiness. Um, my friend Greg Gallagher, a number of years ago, asked me a question, well, why doesn't the Bible say anything about happiness? Well, it does. No, I've looked. Why doesn't God want us to be happy? Well, he, he does. Well, are you sure? Because I met a lot of Christians, and they're not especially happy. And I'm, I'm sad to say that that's, that's still quite true. And Greg and I began a lengthy conversation, eight years. Uh, every Thursday we would meet, and we began studying the sociological and psychological, theological, scientific, philosophical underpinnings of happiness. What does it mean that God wants us to be happy? Does God want us to be happy? How can we be happy if we're unhappy? Is happiness something you find, like buried treasure? You know, you get to find a secret clue to unearth it, and then once you get the secret to happiness, it unfolds before you like a a big open box? Or is happiness more like a garden? Is it something that you cultivate, something that you can grow uh, through industry and through effort? And eventually I published my research in a book called The Adventure of Happiness. We don't have any copies here, but you can get them online, Amazon or wherever. And, and, And that was a really amazing gift for me. Because through that process, I learned how to be happy in seasons of deep unhappiness. When the circumstances of my life were not as I wished them to be, God taught me through the scripture and through my conversations with Greg, my reflections upon the things of God, how to cultivate happiness in unhappy circumstances. And it was funny because as I began to share a lot of that work, many people got frustrated with me, which was really strange. I had Christians tell me repeatedly, God doesn't want us to be happy. He wants us to be holy, which is the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Who, who sets apart happiness and holiness? How does God, who promises us abundant life, who promises us lives of fulfillment and joy, how does the fruit of the Spirit that manifests is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, how does all of that not result in happiness? How do we take Psalms like Psalm 9 that says, I will rejoice in you, my God, my Savior, and imagine that uh, the quality of our rejoicing is woeful, miserly, 
and grievous. It is biblically inconsistent. And uh, so I began to go around and, and teach um, in, in schools. I began to do seminars in different businesses and, and just tell people the good news, as I understood it, that happiness is available if you cultivate it. And during that time, I came across the research of a man named uh, Martin Seligman. He's widely considered the founder of positive psychology. For many years, he was out of the University of Michigan. And he has a really simple formula for happiness. And I give this to you, especially in case you're visiting today, and you're like, is there going to be anything other than sad stories and crying? I mean, geez, you know, I'm glad this guy's leaving. But um, if you're taking notes, Marty Seligman says you can find a, a formula for human flourishing in the acronym PERMA. Now, you might get nervous when I start quoting positive psychologists in church, but what I want you to understand is that as I heard his research, it began to resonate with my biblical understanding. And it takes about four minutes and Google to reverse engineer and find out that all this stuff is dripping in Scripture. So what you need is a positive emotion. Joy, love, love gratitude, optimism. And then you need engagement. That's the E in PERMA, meaning task-focused attention. Find something that you love for which you feel no guilt, woodworking, CrossFit, doesn't matter. Just find yourself, doesn't need to be a hobby, could be music, could be your profession, science. find something where you get totally caught up in it. And if your job sucks and you hate your job, then find something else to compensate for what a miserable cuss you are at work. The R is relationships, healthy relationships. You need friends. You need people that you can do things with whose company you enjoy. You need to be in love. You need to give yourself to somebody whom you love, self-sacrificially, wholly, and eternally. The M, P-E-R-M-A, stands for meaning, by which Seligman intends that you would do things that have lasting and eternal significance and last but not A, the one that's most counterintuitive to Christians, you need to achieve. Now, Christians get nervous about achievement. You know, don't find your identity in your job. Don't find your identity in your education. And I understand all that. There's good cautions, but we've probably overcorrected, don't you think? There's something impressive. There's something noble. There's something helpful to you when you set a goal and you hit it whether that's a PR in the weight room or a, 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 a new certification or degree at work, whether it's a new understanding or even completing reading a book, let alone completing writing one. When you achieve something, you get a little boost that says, yeah, I, I can make a difference. And, and you can. But knowing in theory that you can make a difference is such a different experience than actually having done something and actually have accomplished something that you put your mind to. Um, so that's Seligman's formula, and um, like I said, there's eight years of research that goes into happiness and what it means for Christian people to be happy, and I, I summarized that in 100 words. Greg Glassman, the founder of CrossFit, uh, summarized world-class fitness in 100 words, so he was kind of my inspiration. I thought, can I get happiness down to 100 words? And um, we'll put it up on the screen here. Uh, you can see kind of the, the, the meme that we shared on Facebook. It'll be shared again today if you want to see it. And then up top, you'll be able to see the, the words as we go through it. And you can read along if you like. Don't wait for life to be perfect before you enjoy it. Cultivate positivity, gratitude, and optimism. Evaluate every tree by its fruit, not its soil. Identify and appreciate happy memories. Buy better groceries. <laughs> Increase time outside, meditation, creativity, failure, forgiveness, dancing, exercise, travel, sex, sleep, laughter, Smiling, sports. Avoid unusable information. Sitting, emotionalizing conflict, emphasizing circumstances, excessive screen use, being offended, thinking about yourself, perfectionism, dieting, dwelling on pain. Pursue noble achievements. Commit conscious acts of kindness. Infuse your work with passion. Don't kill time. Enliven it. 
Reframe stress to focus on its positive effects. Daily exercise, signature strength. Now, after a lot of reflection over the last, well, I think this, we published this in 2014, I can tell you, I, I can't get it any better than that. I can't get it more succinct or more accurate than that. If you do these things, you will make a significant and positive difference in your life. And when we first put all this stuff together, I, I, I realized this, this is my gift to you. And this is God's gift to me. Because if it wasn't for you, I never would have learned any of that. And that changed my life. And when the, the unintended consequences of, of doing all these happiness things and ha happiness seminars, I'd travel around, I'd tell people, hey, you can make a difference. Like, you can, you can do stuff. You can be happier. And a lot of times people would go, well, that's great, but, but actually I can't. I can't. There's nothing I can do that will make me any happier at all. I'm not even sure God wants me to be happy. God might be dead set against me. And I realized that as I talked about happiness, many people were not experiencing happiness. They were experiencing despair, which if you've never felt like a failure, that's a fast track way to do it, to promise happiness and watch people glom onto hopelessness. And I couldn't figure it out. I was like, why are people so hopeless? Like, I, here's this gift. Here's the things you can do. How, here's how you can understand it. Why, why aren't they going, thank you? Why am I not being carried around on a palanquin, fed grapes? Like, what's, what, where's the gap? Not so much in, like, whether or not they're celebrating me, but wh why, why can't they get it? And I realized a lot of people just don't feel like they can do anything about their lives. There's a word for that. The word is agency. Many people feel as though they have no agency. It means like whatever they do, it doesn't matter. You know, if somebody's mean to you, you stand up to them, they're still mean to you, doesn't matter. Somebody's mean to you, you ignore them, they're still mean to you, doesn't matter. Somebody's mean to you, your friend comes in and defends you, you walk away, they keep chasing after you, keep being mean to you, and after a while you learn hopelessness because you feel like no matter what I do, it doesn't matter matter. I have no agency. I began thinking about this a lot. And it really led me into my next great biblical research topic. It's a topic of hope. Like, if people have no hope and they feel like they can't do anything and their lives are just hopeless, sh surely the Bible's got to offer something about that, right? Doesn't it kind of feel like that's what the Bible's for? Well, I jumped into the scriptures, and I started realizing quick, like, apparently all the stuff I know in the Bible about hope doesn't help. And that was really frustrating. It's common for Christian people to say, our hope is in Jesus. But that's a sentence that has no meaning. Like, what, I'm just going to look at the cross and then feel better? Has that ever worked for you? I'm going to pray, and then all of a sudden I'll be immediately transformed from hopeless to hopeful because I, now I lay me down to sleep it? So I began to realize there was a gap between what the Bible was promising and what I was understanding as I read the Bible. And for me as a theologian, as an academic, as a professor, that's a big problem. We use hope like a verb. I hope for a better tomorrow. But the Bible often talks about hope um, as a result, Romans 9, Paul says, suffering produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. So if somebody's hopeless, what do you tell them? Suffer more? That's your advice, Paul? That seems scary. So I went on to the magic of the internet, I went on to Amazon. I bought every book for the first five pages in the Amazon search results about hope. Downloaded hundreds of articles and bought dozens of additional books. Went through every scripture about hope. Read every theological treatise about hope. And learned very quick. The only people who write about hope are the people who don't have it. It's depressing. But I really wanted to get to the bottom of it. What is hope? Where does it come from? If somebody is hopeless, can you help them at all grow hope? I learned that the best definition for hope is energy for living. Like you can live without hope, you just won't enjoy life very much. You think about a, a lady going to the gym and getting on the treadmill. 
If she's walking on the treadmill for 30 minutes a day and she has no hope that it will make any difference in her life, that she'll lose any weight or feel healthier or feel more beautiful, she has no hope. She's just trudging on that treadmill, just dying. But if she believes that walking on that treadmill is going to make her healthier, happier, more attractive, more fit, feel better, well, then all of a sudden she's just busting up, right? She's got energy. So hope is energy for living, but how do you get that energy? Like, what can you do that will cultivate energy? Now, here again, I, I really dove deep into the material, trying to synthesize a lot of different sources. And I came to the conclusion that there's a, a formula for hope. But hope is comprised of desire, vision, and agency. Now, there again, there were some sticking points for many Christian people. Many Christian people feel hesitant to have or to be honest about desire. Somewhere in the popular Western evangelical consciousness, there's this idea that wanting things is somehow ungodly. But that didn't make any sense. Like, don't you have a desire to please God? Don't you think that's a good desire? Don't you have the desire to be a, a faithful servant of Christ? If you have children, don't you have a desire that your children would be healthy, that they would flourish, that, that their minds would expand, that they'd be lifelong learners, they'd be curious, they'd be lovers of other people, they'd be philanthropic. Aren't those desires? So clearly some desires are good. It's God who gives us the desires of our hearts, not only meaning that God allows us to desire, but God leads us through that desire. We say desire is the compass of vocation. Desire is the way God leads you forward into your development, into your hope, and into your promise. So I mean, there are hundreds of scriptures that indicate that the things you want are not bad. St. Augustine, our most famous Christian theologian, said, love God and do what you will, meaning love God and let that love purify your desire such that you can trust them, that the desire is the way through which God leads you. So desire is essential to hope. You gotta want something. You gotta want something to be better, your marriage, your health and physical fitness, your, your, your country, your business. You gotta want something to be better and then you gotta have vision, meaning you gotta be able to imagine what it's like living in that world where the things that you want to be better are actually better. And then you got to have agency. You got to have the belief that you can do things now to get you on your way moving forward. And you know, the great lie of COVID is that there's nothing we can do. Here we are, we're stuck. You know, we'll just wait for somebody to change the rules or CDC to change their mind or government to swap out or whatever. But in the meantime, there's nothing we can do. Nothing. What garbage, man. All you got to do to expose that lie is pick up the phone and tell somebody you love them. They feel different. You feel different because the acts of love and kindness transform your reality. There's always something you can do. Always. You got a dream? You want to be a writer? You want to be an astronaut? There's always something you can do in service to that dream. You, you, you envision a time when you and your children have reconciled? There's something you can do now to work your way, inch your way into God's promised future. There's always something. So get after it. God put you here as an emissary, as a missionary, as an ambassador, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the body of Christ, not just theologically, but practically. If God's doing anything in the world at all, it's through you. God has no invisible hands. They're stapled to the end of your wrists. That's where our hope comes from. Knowing Christ lives in us, the hope of glory. Well, again, you, you can't look at all this material and, and expect anybody to remember it, so we thought, well, well, we'll try and synthesize it into 100 words of hopefulness. That way, at least people can keep it on their phone to make bumper stickers or fridge magnets or share it on the Internet. So here it is, the best that all I've learned about hope. Again, you can read along if you like. Hope results from vision, desire, and agency. It's faith we can create a desirable future with God's help under God's authority. 
Enjoy art, sports, learning, reading, serving, ecology, kindness, conservation, and leadership. Imagine healthy scenarios. Recall previous successes. Simulate desirable outcomes. Don't overlearn failures. Love God totally, then do what you will. Cultivate positive emotion, engagement, healthy relationships, meaning, and achievement. Even when you lose hope, keep going. Hope will return, along with energy, passion, and creativity. Make plans, permit contingencies, persist despite opposition, process disappointment, intimidation, and obstacle as growth. Trust that even if you fail, your efforts expand what's possible. That's such a good last statement. Even if you fail, the attempt matters. It matters. Get comfortable with failure. You know, over the years, I sold a fair few books, but the first ones were crap. I mean, absolute garbage. They didn't sell any. They don't read any good. You try and get rid of a bad book on Amazon, good luck, brother. I mean, I do not have that kind of magic. It's just out there, you know, like, like some sort of philosophical flatulence stinking up the universe, and you got no option other than just to live with the fact that sometimes it just doesn't work out. But that's okay. Your failures teach you, make you smarter, to help you grow. More importantly, the ways in which you fail boldly and bravely make space for people coming after you, for your kids to take a risk on their dreams, for your friends and neighbors to have their own imagination expanded about what's permissible, what's beneficial, what's possible, what's true, what's lovely. Your whole life speaks if you let it, and perhaps especially your failures. Now, these two bits of research, happiness and hopefulness, we published. First, again, in The Adventure of Happiness, and then the book that I think is the most important book I've ever written, How to See the Future, a book about hope. Ironically, it's among the least um, popular of the books that I've written, but, well, that's like broccoli for your brain, I guess. I don't know. But this next and final bit of research uh, I never published. I was meant to get around to it, and the timing was just never right. It's love. Strangely, I, I did write a book on sex, but apparently sex and love are not the same thing. If you didn't know that, go ahead, write that down. You'll be grateful later on. But I thought um, if I got just a few minutes to put a really fine point on what I hoped you got from me. It's love. If I got just a few minutes to tell you what I think is critical over and above any competing concern, it's love. It's love. Now, some churches have prioritized politics and working for a better world. Some churches have prioritized theology, doctrine, dogma, some churches have prioritized uh, denominational affiliation, tribalism, a sense of church history and shared experience. There's, there's nothing wrong with any of that, but, but for us, it's love. It's love. And I think about Paul's words uh, in 1 Corinthians, you know, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but I don't have love, it doesn't matter. If I can comprehend mysteries and fathom all knowledge, I don't have love. I'm like a gong. He goes on in this beautiful poem, of course, reciting the thing that everybody knows from weddings. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears up under all things endures all things. Love never fails. And he says, listen, when I was a child, I thought like a child, which means what? When I was a child, I childishly thought that Christian spirituality was about knowledge. I childishly thought that our faith 
was about mystery. I childishly thought that our faith was about uh, the supernatural, tongues and angels and miracles. But when I became a man, I put all that childish nonsense behind me. It's funny, Paul says, you know, looking back, trying to understand all of the ministry of Jesus, it's like looking in a mirror, but the mirror's damn and dirty. You, you can't really see the reflection plainly, but now that you get a little older, it's starting to clear up. And we see that the reflection of Christ is love. And eventually, the mirror will be totally clear. And we'll completely understand what God was doing through Jesus. But now, these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these, of course, is love. Love. A new command I give to you, Jesus said. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is how men will know you're my disciples, by your love for one another. Greater love has no man than this, that he would sacrifice his life for his friends. Love. Love is the thing, man. It is the be-all and the end-all. And here, you know, you might come and you might appreciate the creativity. Me too. You, you, you might appreciate the, 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 the industry, you know, the, 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 the hundreds of people who work so hard to do everything we can to provide hope and healing in Jesus' name. Me too. Uh, but in case you missed it, the point is love. In, in, in case you were hanging on to something else, you know, in, incredible music, wonderful people, community spirit. No, well, that, it's all in service to love. And so, um, my last hundred words at West Winds uh, are about love. Love is the whole thing. We are only pieces. Love everybody, always, for all people wear God's face. Becoming a better Christian requires becoming a better lover. Love doesn't dominate. Love cultivates. Love expels fear, redeems, restores, heals, blesses, and forgives. Love people as they are. No fixing, no saving. Love wills the good of others. People are gifts we continually get to enjoy. Do not only pursue love, but remove the barriers you've erected against it. Let your loves flourish. Love all that you have, lest it be taken from you. Love is the end of religion, for God is love. Friends, my prayer is that the love of God would fill you so completely, all that remains is for your hearts to grow larger. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of living and working and serving these gorgeous people these many years. What a gift. You give good gifts to your children. We don't deserve it. We don't even always know how to appreciate it. We certainly don't always know how to love it, embrace it, receive it, or walk out in it, but... Thanks that your mercy covers us, that love covers a multitude of sins. Pray, Lord, that you'd continue to be our teacher, to lead us and guide us in the way of love, for love is the fulfillment of the law, for Christ is love. And when you look at us, it's Christ that you see, not our filth, not our stupidity, not our dumbness, not our sloth. You see your beautiful son. Lord, help us to see him too in the way that we live, the way that we live, the way that we have our being. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody.